Hear ye, hear ye, for the king has arrived and indeed brewed this raspberry sour. And, my loyal wombats, he will show you how he brewed it. <laughs> Welcome back, brewers and beer lovers, to Flying Wombat TV, the channel all about beer, banter, and bloody good times. So yes, as we mentioned in the cold opener, today we're gonna to be showing you how we made our Imperial Raspberry Sour. Raspberry Imperial Sour? Whatever. We're gonna show you how we made it. So this grain bill consists of six kilos of uh, ale malt, 5.4 kilos of wheat malt, whatever that is in Imperial units. We're gonna to get to crushing and then we're gonna to get to mashing and start showing you guys through the whole process to make this bad boy. Let's get stuck in. <sighs> So the goal with this, and we don't know this at this point in time, unlike the cold opener, because the beer's not done yet, but the goal with this beer is for it to get as close to or over 10% if possible, hence Imperial Sour. We just want it really high ABV. We want a lot of raspberries, so there's gonna be more raspberries than we made, than we used in the original raspberry sour recipe, you know, link to the thing wherever it shows up. And the goal with this is we're gonna be doing a split batch. So half of this is gonna go into the barrel that was holding the oatmeal barrel aged stout. The other half is gonna go straight into a keg. So once again, we're gonna have an AB test of barrel versus fresh. And the whole idea is that the fresh version is gonna stay super fresh, super, super sweet, super raspberry and tangy. The barrel aged version we are really hoping is gonna pick up some of those flavors that are gonna carry over from the uh, barrel aged stout. So, fingers crossed, it might be somewhat Black Forest cake-ish with that raspberry and that chocolate kind of mingling all together. But we'll find out about that one in about yep. four months or something. Yeah. So uh, we'll have to be patient and you'll have to be patient with us. Anyway, let's get back to crushing this and uh, we'll talk more about the recipe in a second. The total grain bill for this one is 12 kilos. And the idea is basically to make a pretty similar um, uh, raspberry Berliner Weiss to the last one but with the goal of it just being more in every way. So more raspberry, more grain, more alcohol, just more of everything. That's, that's pretty much it. Oh, by the way, using rice hulls again. So I'm probably going a little bit overkill with using one kilo of rice hulls, but you probably get away. Generally speaking, rice hulls, you're meant to use 5% of the total grain bill's weight. So this being 12 kilos, I only really need 600 grams of it, uh, which is like, 1.2 pounds um, but never hurts to use a bit more it just means that all this is going to flow through a little bit more nicely and once again if you're new to this or you've never seen rice hulls before it's the hulls from rice it contributes no flavor no color no sugars all it does is accents little tiny tiny springs in amongst all the grains to separate them all a bit more and make it easier to actually uh, sparge and mash and let all the water flow through basically by the way, for those of you who care about the numbers and the stats, the uh, wheat is gonna make up 45% of the grain bill for this one, and the um, ale malt is making up 55%. Doing more than that with wheat tends to get a little bit difficult. You really do start to get a stuck sparge, but um, from experience, uh, using about that much wheat versus ale malt tends to strike a really nice balance with the mouthfeel of these sours. So, that's what we're gonna be running with here. It gives, you know, a decent amount of body. It's silky, silky enough to combat the acidity of the sour. And um, ultimately, the star of the show really is the sour flavor and the raspberry impact. It's not really about the grains. So it's more of just, you know, a nice base for all the other flavors to sit on top of. We have a, uh, an overflow tube here, if you haven't seen this before. Basically, what it means is when the liquid level rises too high based on the recirculation, uh, the excess liquid will just go straight down that tube. The whole idea with recirculating is the work keeps going from the bottom of this whole mash tun up the top and then flows through all the grains, uh, which is pretty handy. You don't need it, so don't stress if you guys don't have something like this. But it, may, it means that you get a more uh, efficient um, mash, generally speaking. It helps to clarify the wort a little bit for beers that need clarity because the grains act like their own natural filter. And it also means that it maintains temperature a little more evenly because everything is consistently moving throughout the entire grain bed and then over the heating elements. But again, don't really need it. It's nice to have, it's not a need to have. But uh, anyway, we are done there. So 
We are now going to let this just keep on pumping around uh, for one hour at 66 degrees Celsius. And then we'll come back at the end of that to start with sparging. Jump transition, jump. You jumped before. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> We're back um, after almost having a catastrophic mistake. <laughs> so uh, we're now sparging. Sorry, I'm trying to get my thoughts together. We're now sparging. So we're gonna let all of this work drain out of the grain bed. And you hear that noise? Hang on, I'll put my, my... Yeah, I can hear that. That is, that is the beautiful trickle clear. of sparge water running out, yeah. which is <laughs> always the worry when you're making something with so much wheat. So that's why you use rice hulls. Without those rice hulls, there would not be a drip. Anyway, this thing is now starting to run through. So now what I need to do is start running sparge water over. So I'm running my sparge water at 81 degrees Celsius and we're gonna use 35 liters in total. Okay, so now we can see that this has drained out just enough. So all we can see is this top mesh. This top mesh has two features. One is when you're doing the actual mashing, it stops the grains from you know, spilling out of the malt pipe. Second feature is you can use this to help with your sparging. This can help more evenly distribute all the water across the grains when you're doing something like this with a bucket or a handheld device instead of using like an actual sparging system. Normally I would use an actual sparging system, but that other vessel is in use making a different beer. Anyway, we just pour all this over top. The idea is to be nice and gentle so you're not disrupting the, uh, the grain bed too much and you're not mixing the different viscosities of the liquids too much because what we're basically working with is liquids of different specific gravities. So the same way that we calculate our uh, potential beer alcohol by measuring the gravity of that liquid, it's the same thing going on in here. So the liquid that's further down this malt pipe is much higher in gravity. The liquid that I'm pouring on top is much, much lower in gravity because it's water. So you don't want those two liquids to mix. You kind of want to keep them as separate as possible. And the whole idea behind fly sparging is that you're gently sprinkling that water on top so that it doesn't disrupt the high gravity liquid down the bottom. It doesn't all mix up. It just slowly keeps on draining through, draining through, draining through, so that you rinse out all of those sugars and they all get carried through at the same rate that it's dripping out of this mash tun. We are now at boiling and it is time to start our timers and add our bittering hops. So. We're gonna boil very aggressively, but I'll talk about that in a second. We have 30 grams here of Northern Brewer. Whack them in there and uh, whack them in. 30 grams, start your timers, one hour of boil. So let me get that going whilst I then talk about the next thing. Okay, we are gonna boil very, very aggressively. We currently have 44 liters of wort here and our gravity reading is, let's find out what we're sitting at and then we can make a decision about what we actually do from here because we're running a little bit low on liquid. Okay, we're at 1.0, 1.067, which is not as high as I wanted. With a very aggressive boil, I reckon we could potentially get to like 1.0, low 1.07s, maybe 1.073 with a very, very aggressive boil with all the elements on. Um, it's not as high as I wanted. I wanted this thing to be a 10%er, we've missed again. It's gonna be more <laughs> like, I think, eight and a half percent if we play our cards right. I need to assess how much uh, alcohol the raspberry puree is gonna add. It will give us some level of booze. I'm just not sure how much. So I've got to do some maths about that off camera another day. Uh, but the other thing that we're doing is, we have still got our grain, um, our grain tube, what do you call it? Our Mash malt pump. pipe, our malt <laughs> pipe. We still got our malt pipe here. It still has some liquid draining out here. So I'm gonna collect that whilst this starts boiling. At about halfway through the boil, I'm gonna see how much liquid I actually have collected. And I'm gonna dump that in here and we'll see what the gravity is on that. Because we do need to bump up the volume a bit, but we can't just add straight water because it will dilute the alcohol level. Mm. So this remaining last drips of sparge is our only chance to kind of bump up that level of liquid that we kind of need to be able to do a split batch. So we'll see how this plays out and we'll update you shortly. In any case, the next time you guys are gonna see us is at the 45 minute mark, we're gonna come back and we're gonna throw in our flavor and aroma hops and I'll talk about those then. We are now at 15 minutes left in the boil, so it's time to add both our one and a half grams of Whirlflock, so just chuck that in there. And then we are also got 40 grams of Huel Melon Hops. So German style of hop, we've used this in all of our sours. A lot of melon flavors, fruity flavors, kind of um, 
you know, juicy sort of flavors. Only 40 grams, we don't need a whole lot. The star of the show is the sour. So just chuck those in and then get your clocks going again because in 15 minutes we're gonna go flame out and we're gonna drop this down to yeast pitching temperature. So we'll see you for that. We are now at one hour of boiling and it's time for flame out. So connect up your cooling systems. In this case, we're gonna be using a chiller plate for today uh, and turn off your flame and start whirlpooling or, you know, cooling, whatever you wanna call it. We're gonna start pumping this one through and cooling it right down. And then we're gonna take a gravity reading to see where we're actually at for this thing. I am curious, oh, are we pumping all right? Oh, it's a bit too hot for the pump. Uh, It'll get there. Okay, so we want to see what this is going to be at once we start cooling it down a little bit. I'm hoping we're sitting somewhere around 1.075. I would be happy with that. And then we can kind of figure out from there how much raspberries you want to add. But I've got an idea for that in a second. So boil has finished. We're now down to yeast pitching temperature. So this is at 25 degrees Celsius. We have had to make a sacrifice. We are the, in the fortunate position where, because we're home brewers, we can, we can care more about the quality of something rather than making more quantity, which is definitely the true in the case here because we've only ended up with about 38 liters of work, which is way, way, way under what I actually wanted. But I'm making that sacrifice in exchange for having a higher gravity batch. So this is now sitting at 1.074. And with a bit of quick maths, if this ferments out to say 1.01, we're gonna end up with say something around 8.2%. After the raspberry addition, we might get a little bit more fermentation out of that. So all things said and done, I'm expecting this to be about an 8.5% imperial sour, uh, raspberry sour. So not the 10% that we wanted, but pretty bloody close. In any case, we need to get transferring. So we're gonna pump all of this into our um, stainless steel uni tank. So I'm just gonna hit the pump there. And uh, from here, the next time you guys are gonna see us is when I'm pitching the raspberries. But before we get to that, we do need to talk about the yeast. We're using Philly sour yeast. So there's two reasons that I'm using this. One, I want this to be a sour, but I don't want it to be a super sour. So we could go kettle sour, or we could use a lot of Brettromyces to really sour it down with like different uh, wild yeast bacteria and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of routes we could take, but I don't want this to be a super acidic sour. I want it to be like a pleasant Berliner Weiss. It is sour enough to call it a sour, but it's not like it's blowing your socks off with acidity. So that's why one reason for the Philly sour. The second reason is because we are throwing this into the stainless steel uni tank, I don't really want this to forever be a sour tank. So using something like this means that we're not gonna infect this tank and we're not gonna be able to get that bacteria out afterwards. This is still basically regular yeast. So we can clean this out with a caustic and then an acid wash and that thing's gonna be fine. So yeah, at some point on the channel, we'll do a proper kettle sour and we'll use actual sour like um, lacto, which we have a nice culture going on inside here. So more stuff in the works with all that kind of thing. But we have developed a culture that we're gonna use for a real sour at some point later. In any case, we're gonna transfer all of this into here. We're gonna use two packets of this. That's 23 grams total, which is like, I don't know, 0.8 of an ounce, I think. Something along those lines for the Americans out there. And then we are gonna go with a ratio of about seven liters, every seven liters, one kilogram of raspberries. That's, I think, what we wanna run with here. The last time we made the sour on the channel, it was 7.3 to one kilogram of raspberries. So I'm gonna have a little play around, a little think of that, but I think that's the ratio I'm gonna run with. So that will be about, what, seven kilos of raspberries, something along those lines. Anyway, we'll talk about that when we come back, but we will see you guys when we're dumping the raspberries into this tank. So see you soon. There we go. That was a lot of work, but all the raspberries are now pureed and <laughs> it's a big bucket of raspberry soup. Now, I'm gonna pour all of this into the tank, but before I do that, I am curious, because I actually haven't measured this before. I wanna know what the you know, original gravity of just a big thing of raspberries is. I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to measure it properly with this. Let's find out. Uh, yeah, okay, I have no idea. It looks like it might be somewhere in the ballpark of like, 1.027, but I really don't know how accurate that actually is. Um, okay, whatever, it doesn't matter. What I am now going to do is whack all this stuff into the tank. I have been fermenting under a tiny bit of pressure. So, by the way, the reason that I fermented under uh, a little bit of pressure was so that when I did open this up, it would release a bit more carbon dioxide than it normally would as the thing was open. So hopefully it can just help protect it a little bit with a little bit of a CO2 blanket forming over the top of the beer. 
There we go. Let's try not to spill any of this. Now, when we made this, I ended up with a lot less liquid than I wanted, but I was kind of all right with that because I knew that when I added all of this raspberry puree, we were gonna massively increase the actual volume. So this is an 11 liter bucket. It was almost full. So I'd say this is like, I don't know, maybe nine liters of total liquid that we're adding to this thing. Granted, a lot of this will be sludge that settles down at the bottom, but it might also help to uh, give us two, whoops, two full kegs by the end of this thing. Yeah, this was a very expensive uh, grain bill <laughs> with all of these raspberries. <laughs> so if you guys can find a cheaper way to do it, please let me know because I do really love making this beer, but man, that was, uh, yeah, that was an ex more money than I'd ever expect to spend on raspberries in my life. <laughs> Anyway guys, that is it. We are done and dusted with the Imperial Raspberry Sour Brew Day. Um, next time you guys see us, we will be tasting this on the camera. Actually no, you're gonna see us in just a minute when I transfer half of this into a barrel. So, back in a tick. And we're back and it is finally time to transfer this Raspberry Imperial Stout, uh, Sour, sorry, into the barrel. So, this is the barrel that used to hold the uh, barrel aged oatmeal stout it's been recently emptied and if you guys haven't done barrel aged beers before the reason we wanted to line these up so closely is because when a barrel goes dry it really quickly starts to um, cop a bit of damage so it's best to always keep it full with something so that the wood stays watertight basically so this thing's just been recently emptied we're going to fill it straight back up again what I've done here is I've got the gas line pumping into the, at really low pressure, like one PSI, pumping into the tap, and I've got this lid loosely opened, with the idea being we're just trying to basically purge it uh, with a bit of CO2 at the moment, make sure that there's less oxygen in here so we don't damage our beer. And then over here, we have this inline filter set up ready to go on the tank. So as you can see down the bottom, there's a lot of trub, if you can see down there. I made a few mistakes with the way that I use these raspberries and I'll talk about them in a second once we start transferring. But the really cool thing about this filter here, this inline filter, which I recently got from uh, Brew Tools, is that A, you've got a couple of different meshes, so you've got different sizes of filter you can actually apply. But the really, really cool part is that you can purge this thing, which I've already done. So you can connect the gas post to the beer post, flush this thing with CO2 and then release it. With the, uh, with the little release valve there so that you don't have to do that sacrificial beer loss. You don't have to get that first pour coming out and dump it out because you've already purged this thing with CO2. So it's already a zero oxygen environment, which is really, really cool. Anyway, that's enough talking. Let's get to the actual transferring, shall we? So we're gonna connect this beer line up to this, um, uh, what do you call it, bung that goes into the bung hole. It's not a perfect fit with this one, with this bit of tube going into this. And that's intentional because we need air to come out while liquid goes in, otherwise we're gonna have an explosion. So it's just, just enough uh, space in there that my idea is that if this is sitting at the bottom of the barrel, the now carbon dioxide that is sitting there is just gonna slowly be pushing out of this tiny, tiny hole in this um, bung hole. So at least that's the theory anyway. So let's connect this thing onto here. All right, so now we've got the um, beer post connected to the beer post there. There should be nothing left to do, except open this up, pop this in, push this down all the way in. Yeah, that's about the bottom there. Okay, now we should be done and ready to transfer. Let's open you up. Whoop. And we are transferring, and I've just realized I made my first mistake. Let's turn the scales on. <laughs> I've done this uh, on the scales just so that I know how much beer actually goes into this thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all that's about. All right. Now, that post connected there. Let's turn the gas up a little wee bit. And we should be good to start transferring. So this inline filter is really, really cool. I love the visual display you get. Um, being able to see all the clarity of the beer as it kind of transfers over. That's, that's pretty awesome. Anyway, I can do a whole video on that particular inline filter if you guys are curious later. No dramas about that. Anyway, this thing is uh, transferring. When this is done transferring, we'll close this up and then we'll start putting the rest of this beer into the keg. So we'll come back for that in a sec. All right, that is transfer one complete. So we have exactly 20 
uh, kilos and 220.2 kilos inside this barrel. So just about 20 liters, which is awesome. Super keen to start aging that one and let it just sit to the side for the next couple of months. But we still have a decent amount of beer left in this keg, uh, in this tank. So let's transfer it over. Actually, let's take this whole thing off. Now let's transfer the rest into the keg. So this keg has already been cleaned. It's already been purged with CO2. So has the uh, beer alliance. So there's no damage to the beer as it comes into here. Um, is that everything? Yep. Let's connect you up to this. And let's connect this up here. Come on. There we go, just gonna keep that really loose because there is no pressure inside this thing, so it's not a pressure transfer, which I'm used to doing. Now, let's transfer the beer over. Booyah. By the way, uh, as you can tell from the hydrometer over there, uh, I don't know if you guys can actually see it over there. Let's bring it up over to you. This thing finished with a gravity of about 1.012, but this is at two degrees Celsius. So using the temperature correct, uh, the hydrometer correction calculator on theflyingwombat.com.au, um, I figured out that the gravity is 1.01. .01. So we finished out pretty dry for a beer, which is awesome. So this thing is, if all calculations are correct, an eight and a half percent Imperial Raspberry Sour. It's at least above 8%, I know that much for sure, but I'll double check when we do the actual tasting video. In any case guys, I'm gonna finish transferring all the rest of this over into this keg here. And then that is pretty much done. The whole Raspberry Imperial Sour Brew Day is finished. Thank you ever so much for everyone that's still sticking along for the ride. We will keep you updated on little regular posts on how that raspberry barrel aged uh, sour is going over there. And then in about four months, we should get to tasting that. So be patient. We're going to have to be patient, but super, super keen to see how that one turns out. In any case, guys, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you so much for sticking along. Don't forget to check out our website, theflyingwombat.com.au. And as always, uh, we'll catch you next time. Brew on, guys. See you later.